Brian Davis. I'm the Associate Dean in the Washkowitz College of Engineering at Cleveland State University. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you here today. I, I'm so thrilled today to be standing here introducing a friend, a colleague of mine. We've known each other for longer than I care to admit, Dr. Vanden Burgert. Um, you see his picture on the screen here. We're going to, for those of you who don't know, he has retired from Cleveland State University. That was a shock to my system. Um, I don't think it should be allowed actually, but it, he is a favorite among students. Uh, he's very highly respected by faculty. And so what he's going to share with us today is a lecture that is entitled From Horses to Hollywood. And it's going to describe, and, and probably beyond that as well, it's going to describe the work that he initially did uh, as a PhD student um, on horse mechanics and how that led from one thing to the other. He's got his PhD from Utrecht University. Then he went to North America. His welcome to North America was through the University of Calgary, and I'm showing the symbol for the University of Calgary. It's, it's, um, it's their symbol uh, you know, and represents what the university stands for. But where Dr. Van den Bogart and I, I think, first initially met was, was back in 1995. We both had grants funded by the Whitaker Foundation, and this was a foundation that focused primarily on um, biomedical engineering. And if you were a young faculty member trying to develop a career in biomedical engineering, you pretty much needed to get funding from the Whitaker Foundation. And so we were both fortunate to be in that situation. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to show a clock of Dr. Van den Berger. So that, this was 1995. In 1998, Cleveland was extremely fortunate to have him join the professional staff of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, that's where we worked really closely for many years. If I go to the three o'clock position in the clock, you see that X. That represents, I believe, his first NIH R01 grant. It was on cruciate ligament biomechanics, hence the X. Um, that led to, obviously, an Academy Award. Um, so there's a picture of Tan standing right next to um, the symbol for the Academy Award. He then did some pioneering work with Ahmed Erdemir at the Cleveland Clinic. And what was unusual about this research, it was also, by the way, funded by the NIH, was that it incorporated the specialty of Dr. Van Bogert, which is um, computational modeling, with what Dr. Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Erdemir is, uh, is um, specialized in, and that is finite element modeling. And they were looking specifically at the uh, biomechanics of the, of the foot and, and soft, de soft tissue deformation and basically soft tissues in general in the foot. And it was a coupling of finite element modeling and multi-body modeling. It was, it was a, a pioneering approach to biomechanics at the time. That's in the five o'clock position. Dr. Van Bogart, I'm not sure if this is because of him winning an Academy Award, just but in general, his technical skills are such that they are highly sought after by people all over the world. And so MoTeC um, brought him on as a consultant, and not just MoTeC, but Adidas as well. Two international companies, highly respected, um, utilizing Dr. Van Bogart's skills. If we switch to, um, this is like 2011. I haven't given the dates for all of these things, but they are in chronological order. 2011, he became the president of the International Society of Biomechanics. Um, for those of you who don't know, once before, many years ago, the two of us organized a combined International Society of Biomechanics and American Society of Biomechanics meeting here in Cleveland. Uh, we're still recovering from that. Um, in 2012, he joined Cleveland State University and made a huge impact here. Uh, he served in multiple capacities, multiple leadership roles. Um, um, one of the things he did when he sh shortly after arriving at Cleveland State University is he wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation to deal that dealt with energy expenditure in prosthetic uh, designs and how you can make amputee patients walk more efficiently with this technology. Um, he then, this is in the 11 o'clock position, this, this image here represents a number of things about Dr. Van den Bogart. In, in this case, it's a collaboration between his group and Case Western Reserve University, but it is also an example of using artificial intelligence, which nowadays is thrown about you know, all over the place. You can go to any 
news media and you'll hear about artificial intelligence. But Dr. Werner Bogert was one of the pioneers in biomechanics using this, this uh, approach. Now, sadly, apparently, if, if everything is to be believed, he has retired. Um, but he has his own company, Orchard Kinetics, um, which has been around for a while, but this is, this is the, his base right now. If um, anybody approaches him, it's through Orchard Kinetics. So this is a clock view of Dr. Van der Now, I was thinking about this, and I thought, how can I spice this up a bit? And I remember back to a time when I visited the south of France in the Provence region, and there was a town there called Roussillon, and in particular, a artist, his name's Tapiezo, and you see some of Tapiezo's work on the screen here. And I thought, well, let me take a chance here. <laughs> let me see if I can encapsulate Dr. Van Bogart's career in the form of a Tapiezo piece of artwork. So instead of the Whitaker Foundation, I have the symbol W. Instead of the Cleveland Clinic logo, I've got um, what you see on the screen there. It's hard to describe. <laughs> uh, his crucial ligament research is uh, represented by an X. His Academy Award may be hard to see, but that's represented in the uh, four o'clock position. He's worked with Dr. Ahmed Erdemir on combining multi-body simulations with finite element modeling. He's in the five o'clock position. He's worked with MoTeC, six o'clock, Adidas, president of, of the International Society of Biomechanics, joining CSU, getting NSF funding, doing artificial intelligence research, and now his company. And that is pretty much the bookend. Oh, also where he started, the um, University of Utrecht and the circle representing the University of Calgary around it. That's the, the front of his, the first part of his story, the second part of his story. And you can fill the entire thing up and you can make something that, I don't know what to call it. But anyway, <laughs> um, Sheikh, you just come forward now. Well, th thank you so much, Brian, and for inviting me and this wonderful artwork. It's uh, really special. It's going to have a good place in, in my house. Um, so as Brian mentioned, um, I've recently retired, and that is a good time to look back a little bit. Um, and uh, I'll start you know, where I started with my PhD work. I had the good fortune um, Although my undergraduate degree was in physics, I did my PhD in a veterinary school in uh, a department of anatomy. And Fritz Hartmann was my PhD advisor. Uh, he's a veterinarian and a professor of anatomy at that time. Uh, behind him, you can see um, the gross anatomy lab with students working. And I was a teaching assistant in that lab, which was a, uh, really a, a great experience. And then on the right is a typical um, uh, scenario of, of me working uh, on a research project. So you can see some instrumentation there. Um, uh, and uh, we always had this umbilical cord to record all the signals. And I think there we had something like 32 channels in there that we could, we could record from various instruments. When I arrived in the lab, they were, they were very focused on experimental techniques. Uh, and a few of them are here, and I learned to use all of them, which was a great experience. So mechanical testing, uh, mainly of tendons, and uh, I think the capacity of that testing machine was 20 kilonewtons. Um, then uh, in vitro limb mechanics, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the mechanics of the uh, limbs of horses, and you can actually test them uh, passively uh, in compression, and they can do weight bearing. Uh, as an isolated limb. Uh, and then in vivo techniques, which is very special. Uh, so strain transducers implanted in tendons, uh, rosette strain gauges on bones. Uh, so you could get some idea of the mechanics inside the body. And that's very unique because we don't do that in humans. And even in animals nowadays, it's not really done uh, enough anymore, I think. So this talk is really about how one thing uh, led to another. And I've picked three topics that are kind of interesting uh, to me. Uh, I'll start with musculoskeletal anatomy of horses and how that eventually led to some really important ideas for exoskeletons and prosthesis. Um, 
The other uh, thing uh, that I worked on is soft tissue artifact in horses. So that's related to uh, motion capture. A soft tissue artifact means that you put markers on the skin and, you, and the bones are not moving in the same way as the skin. So you get errors. Um, some of that ended up in, in uh, motion capture for animation, and that's the Hollywood part of the, of the story. Uh, and finally, um, I did some work on the effect of uh, various horseshoes on tendon strain in rehabilitation for, for tendon injuries. And um, that was really a, a good starting point for my simulation-based research. Well, starting with the musculoskeletal anatomy, uh, in horses, and I'll describe the hind limb a little bit. And it's actually very special. Um, you can probably recognize, if you go on the left, you can uh, recognize the pelvis at the top, pelvis here, then there's the hip joint and the femur, and the knee in horses is called stifle. Uh, then we've got the, the tibia, the fibula is, is very small in horses, not really functional. Then we go to the ankle, which in horses is either called tarsal joint or the hock joint in, in more the, the, um, the horse world terminology. Then we have the foot below that, and the foot is not on the ground like in humans. We have the metatarsal. And um, in horses, the foot has really been reduced to only the middle toe. So that's the third metatarsal that you see. They still have a second and a fourth, but they are extremely small and not functional. The first and the fifth are completely gone. Uh, and then you have the, the third uh, digit, the third toe. And finally, the hoof, which is the toenail. Um, below the knee, the leg is very slender, and it's basically just uh, tendons. And above the knee, you have a very big quadriceps and hamstrings, and that's where all the power is generated. But um, because there is so little mass below the knee, you can get really fast movements um, without requiring a lot of energy. So that's why horses can be so fast. Um, on the right side, I've tried to indicate a little bit the types of tissue in, these, in, this, in, the, in the soft tissue structures. So whatever is green is tendon tissue, and uh, red is muscle tissue. So you can see most of it is tendon. Uh, and even the red parts, they have very strong uh, passive elastic properties. So they're almost like elastic uh, cables. So one thing that uh, was identified in, uh, in the anatomy world is the so-called reciprocal apparatus. And that is a kinematic coupling between the knee and the ankle through the gastrocnemius in the back. And you can see how little muscle fibers there is in the gastrocnemius. It's, it's practically a tendon. And then in the front is the peroneus tertius muscles, muscle, which humans also have, but in humans it starts below the knee. In horses, somehow it has migrated to an, an uh, attachment point above the knee. And so it starts above the knee, and it ends below the ankle. And what you really get there is a four-bar linkage. Uh, and you have the, the green soft tissue structures in the front on the back. And you need both of them, because tendons can only be loaded in tension. So you need one for one direction of load and one for the other. I would have brought the model, but it got lost in the lab move a few years ago. But this is how this kinematic coupling, so what I'm doing there is I flex the knee and everything else flexes. So that's how a horse can, can uh, flex the whole leg by just controlling one muscle, which would be the hamstrings probably. The other thing uh, that's very important is so-called passive stay apparatus. Um, that is a weight-bearing uh, mechanism. So the uh, the, the, the tendons that are, that are passive on the back of the leg, they will prevent the leg from collapsing. And so we did experiments like that. You have take a hind leg and you can remove the quadriceps and the hamstrings because they don't really do anything. Um, you have to lock the patella on the knee joint and the knee joint is actually constructed so that horses can do that. 
Um, and that's how they can sleep while they're standing and they can basically stand all day and never get tired. So that's the passive stay apparatus. There is a little demonstration of how that works. So it's, it makes the leg nice and springy. It's like the suspension uh, in a car and you don't need active muscle forces to, to bear weight. So the design principle there is you have passive elastic structures crossing multiple joints and that can accomplish energy transfer from one joint to another. That's the kinematic coupling part, but also energy storage and release because they're springy. And so one day I was teaching uh, muscle mechanics for orthopedic residents at the Cleveland Clinic and in the shower early in the morning, the classes are at 7 a.m., I was thinking, okay, how am, how am I going to explain that uh, you know, elastic tendons are useful. And I, suddenly this idea popped in my mind, well, if it's useful for horses, could it also be useful for humans? So what if you could attach such things to a human leg? Could that be helpful for walking? And where would you attach them? And what should the elastic properties be? Um, and I became really obsessed with that idea for a couple of weeks and I wrote the code to do the design optimization. And the design optimization uh, basically works like this. We have some joint movements for walking that we know from ocean capture. So I just use the standard database for walking kinematics. Um, then if you have certain design parameters, which would be the attachment point of the structure and the elastic properties, you can put that into a mathematical model and calculate how much force would be generated. And because the, they uh, are attached to the bones, you get uh, joint moments. And we also know how much joint moment is required for walking from standard uh, human motion data. So you could say, let's subtract the moments generated by the structures from what's required, and then there's the residual. And we want to do as much as possible with those structures. So we want to minimize the residuals. And you can do that for joint powers as well. So I published that in, in 2003 and I came up with a optimal design, uh, actually a series of optimal designs, um, which showed that you could get about 70% reduction in joint moment by just helping people buy these elastic structures. Now the 70% is achieved with a very complicated system where you have the, uh, uh, a structure going all the way from one foot up into the pelvis, down into the other foot, and then you have one that's a mirror image of that. So that's 12 pulleys uh, to guide those structures in each leg. That's overly complicated, but even the, the uh, design B, which has only three joints involved, uh, already gets a reduction of about 50%, th theoretically. This is all theory, right? Um, so you can see on the bottom right the joint moments, uh, the solid lines is what's required for normal walking, the dotted lines are the, are the residuals. So you can see that you could really reduce those high peaks and provide them with passive elastic structures. That idea was eventually commercialized and it's, it's been a, it, it was a, quite a long path. The, 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 the patent application uh, came quite quickly, but then it took uh, a while for a company to get interested. Um, but finally, in I think it was 2009, um, Cadence Biomedical licensed it and developed it into the so-called kickstart walking system. And it's been uh, quite successful for some patients with things like MS, uh, incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, it's a passive system, so it doesn't move you. You have to put uh, some movement in, and then it helps you. So it's, it's a certain class of patients that will benefit from it. Um, I don't think it's currently available anymore in the United States, but it, they've been acquired by a company in China, and it's um, been uh, quite successful there. So compared to powered exoskeletons, this is so much simpler. You don't need uh, batteries or a control system. Um, so much, much cheaper and you can uh, achieve quite a bit with it. So that was inspired by the legs of horses uh, coming to a passive uh, exoskeleton. And that also led to some, some concepts in prosthesis design that um, I've explored during my time at CSU. So 
first of all, an energy storing prosthetic knee, uh, you see the diagram at the top, that was a hydraulic system initially and that was uh, an idea that was actually coming from, uh, from Dr. Brian Davis. Um, and we collaborated with some people at CSU while we were still at the Cleveland Clinic. Then that eventually turned into an electromechanical system uh, that was done by Hans Richter. Uh, and from Hans Richter I learned how to do modeling of electromechanical systems and um, we did some theoretical work on a knee ankle prosthesis. So electromechanical and you have two joints involved, so two motors and you can transfer energy from one motor to another. These are two geared motors that you can get with Lego toys and uh, you connect one to the other and then if you grab one motor and you turn the shaft the other shaft will also turn. So you're transferring energy from one shaft to another, not with cables, but with electricity. Um, and then this is a more elaborate system with the actual circuit, with a capacitor for uh, energy storage um, and a control system. So my second uh, topic is motion capture. And that starts in, in 1985, which is the year I started my PhD. We got a big grant from the Ministry of, uh, of Agriculture in the Netherlands because horse breeding uh, is, is a very big industry there. And so they wanted us to do some uh, motion capture research. So at that time, this was like the most exciting motion capture system. It was the CODA 3 scanner. Um, it was three rotating light beams coming out of one box. So you had no lenses. Um, these were just light beams that were sweeping across the room and then when the reflection comes back from a marker uh, the timing of that reflection would indicate uh, information about where that marker is. Uh, it's factory calibrated, you don't have tripods or multiple cameras, it's all in one box. Extremely accurate, 0.3 millimeters in the sagittal plane and uh, 1.2 in the other direction. Uh, but it didn't work. Um, so mainly it was because the, the color-coded prisms, there were eight of them, so we could do eight markers, which is you know, a small number, but it was already quite exciting back then. It couldn't distinguish the color. So this is the blue one, number five, that was my favorite. I did a lot of tests with, with that marker, but as soon as you had more than one marker, it just got all confused. And um, talking to the company, they went out of business and then they couldn't support us anymore and then in 1988 we said let's just redesign the whole thing and finally in 1989 when I finished my PhD the machine was working. So PhD students had to have alternative projects and so I was kind of steered into modeling and simulation and my colleague in the surgery department, uh, he was a veterinarian, uh, went into soft tissue artifact and that makes a lot of sense in horses because it's kind of ridiculous to have 0.3 millimeters accuracy when the skin and the markers they slide over the bone for much more than that distance. So we wanted to know something about soft tissue artifact. So this is his work. Um, he came up with this idea to have LEDs under the skin that would shine through the skin and then you could see the bone motion through the skin. Uh, so LEDs implanted from the medial side uh, just until they bumped into the skin on the lateral side and then um, that LED would be surrounded by skin markers and then uh, it's probably hard to see in the picture but the crosshairs are centered on LEDs on both sides of the joints and then each LED is surrounded by four skin markers and you can really see a large motion of the bone relative to the skin. And that had to be recorded with photography because movie uh, film is not sensitive enough for those faint uh, lights. Um, and then we came up with, that was actually my idea to, to uh, use an accelerometer on the hoof to determine the heel strike and then the the photo camera would tell us exactly when the photo was taken relative to the heel strike. Um, but you could only use it uh, in the distal part of the limbs where the bone is directly under the skin. If there was any muscle between the bone and the skin, you couldn't really do that anymore. So higher up in the limbs, um, you know, we, we were actually 
going to a conference in Berlin and we were driving back and he had just presented that LED work. And he said, yeah, we can't really go anywhere else. We could put a pin in the bone instead of an LED and then have the pin stick out through the skin, but then the pin would interfere with the skin motion that we're studying. Uh, I said, but you don't need to put the pin where you're studying the skin motion. You could put that pin anywhere because the bone is a rigid body. So if you know the position and orientation, um, you can you know where every point of the bone is. So we went with that idea, and so there is a, a point on the femur where it's very convenient to place a pin, and then we had a couple of markers uh, mounted on that pin. We call it the propeller because that's what it looks like. Um, and then uh, you have a skin marker on the hip and a skin marker on the knee. And then when you watch the horse walking, it was actually quite remarkable. You see this propeller moving, and you see the skin marker, and it's like they're not uh, consistent with each other. It's like, oh, the pin must be loose. No, the pin wasn't loose. You could feel it. So the bone is moving in a way that you don't expect by looking at the skin markers. And just I have a couple of graphs here from the hip. In the anterior posterior direction at the hip, that skin marker moves 150 millimeters back and forth uh, relative to the bone. This is an enormous amount. So basically with skin markers, you don't have any idea what's going on with the bones. And so since this is the American Society of Biomechanics, I should say six inches. Um, all right. So we. He did that for 17 anatomical sites, so some of them with the LEDs and some of them with the, with the bone pin. And we came up with mathematical models to do soft tissue artifact correction for walk and trot on all these 17 sites. Uh, some mathematical models had it as a function of joint angle and some had it as a function of time in the gait cycle. Um, this is a little demonstration of, of how much difference it makes. So this is a knee angle during walking. And the solid line is what you get from the skin markers. And this knee flexes very rapidly at the beginning of the uh, swing phase. Sorry, uh, yeah, at the end of, sorry, at the end of the uh, swing phase. And then the knee seems to be extending. So this downward motion, that's an extension motion of the knee during the stance phase. And that just repeats. After you do the correction, that's the dotted line, the knee angle is quite constant during the stance phase. And it's more like a uh, damped oscillation, which is sort of what you would expect from mass spring systems. Uh, so that's the knee angle, that's the ankle angle. And then if you plot them against each other, before the uh, soft tissue artifact correction, so with skin markers, you get this loop. After you do the correction, you get much more of a straight line. So a nice kinematic coupling, exactly as you would expect from that reciprocal apparatus that has those, that four bar linkage. So that was quite successful. And I then, when I was at the University of Calgary, I kind of became some, somewhat of a guru on soft tissue artifact. And we did a huge study on soft tissue artifact in human walking and running. That's one of the most successful collaborations I've ever had with Arne Lundberg in uh, Stockholm, in Sweden. That was done with uh, you know, bone pins in the femur, tibia, and calcaneus. So they, they ran and walked with three bone pins um, and then was recorded with three cameras on 16 millimeter film. We tried a, the qualysis system that they had, but the tracking was not reliable enough. So we said, let's just use movie cameras, then we can always uh, use the data and by manual uh, digitizing. And so the a series of publications came out of that, and I published the last one in 2008 from that data. So it's a very unique data, and some of that data is actually now available for, for sharing if people want to work with it. Have, and the superficial digital flexor tendon is actually one that's very commonly affected. And if you prescribe the heel wedge, you're actually making it worse. It's a very important information. I did find out that in 1895, a German veterinarian in the German army already knew that that shouldn't be prescribed, but that knowledge had been forgotten. So, 
So, uh, looking at joint moments, you see a posterior shift in the center of pressure, quite substantial, during the push-up and the force is really large. And so you're reducing the joint moments because this ground reaction force gets closer to this joint and it gets also closer to this joint. You're reducing the joint moments. If you did a kind of muscle force estimation based on joint moments, you would conclude that the muscle forces have gone down because the moments generated by them have gone down. That's exactly what the static optimization or any, any optimization would tell you. But that conflicts with the strain data. So clearly, that would not have been a good way to interpret those, uh, the force plate data. So I have been working on forward dynamic simulation, and um, I actually put in my PhD uh, dissertation, I put a floppy disk where you could generate those animations on your, uh, on your PC. This one was done with 60 millimeter film from a graphics terminal connected with a modem and you know, all the primitive technology of that time. Um, so that was my, my simulation, and I did it based on five forces. So I had that. And then just to show that that wasn't motion capture, I did something else just to demonstrate that it was simulated. It wasn't just motion capture. Right? So I had this simulation running, and then I basically took the joints out. And then all these body parts, they just keep going with their inertia and they're bouncing on the ground. Just to show people that it was simulated, it was not real. So in that simulation, I could easily change the shape of the shoe. And the peak forces and the tendons uh, changed exactly like the tendon strain measurements had told us from the strain data. So two of them, the force went up, and then the other two, they went down. Uh, I also did soft ground. So I had a model where the stiffness of the ground was very low, and it was basically just uh, viscous. And all four of them went down. So that's a good thing to do for the application. Have them walk on sand. And what's the explanation for getting this result from a simulation that's much better than from the inverse dynamics, it's because the simulation has muscle models with passive elastic properties. So if you rotate one bone, which is the hook, you're shortening certain tendons. Uh, the force will go down because they're elastic, and then the other forces need to go up because the total torque still needs to be the same. You're still weight there. So that's simulation instead of This led to many simulation projects. So uh, vibration in horse limbs, I did that with my colleague, Alan Wilson, uh, and that was published in Nature in 2001. That was really cool, because it shows that um, passive stay apparatus that can act kind of like a pogo stick to support body weight. But then if you have a, uh, an excitation in another direction, you can pluck the thing like a string on a guitar and it vibrates laterally. This is up and down, one hertz natural frequency of running. And then the lateral uh, is something like 30 hertz. And you see that actually in, in motion capture and force data. You see that 30 hertz. So that was interesting. And then a lot of human stuff, sprint cycling and, and running and, and sports injuries, optimal control, uh, running shoes with Adidas, and they can discover uh, novel movements. So here is like, if you had to walk with a somersault in each step, how would you do that? Well, this is how you would do that. So if you can do things like that with simulation, discover new things for gymnastics. And I just realized I forgot the dynamic arm simulator, which you can see on the camera in the last uh, poster. So uh, some conclusions are a little more on the, on the technical side. So in musculoskeletal design, uh, you have to realize that has been optimized over millions of years. So it, it, it has pretty good energy saving mechanisms that you can learn from. Um, motion capture, what really makes it strong is the fusion of data and models. That's you know, optimal estimation type of ideas. Don't just trust the data, but run it through a model 
but also you don't completely trust the model either. Of course. Uh, push from industry was extremely important. This might never have happened if the industry hadn't been demanding a better uh, solution. Injuries and rehabilitation, really important to have mechanical properties of muscle included in, in models. Don't trust static optimization. Um, trust measurements more than models. And I feel like people should do more things with direct measurements. Maybe try to use ultrasound or, or imaging to really know what's going on in the tendons and the bones. The models are now available. They have open sim. You can download it and you can run it. Um, and people do that because it's easy. But you can't trust models all the time. So that needs to be a measure. And that's kind of the tradition that I came from. Even though I got really good at modeling, I came from experimental things. Some more life lessons learned. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your PhD is about because <laughs> You can really do anything. Um, get really good at what you do. You have to focus, but not too much. You have to have a broad interest and recognize and pursue opportunities. Especially look at industry. And I certainly had fun while doing all of this, and that's uh, advice I would give. Anyway.